All right, perfect. So, people forget Leonardo da Vinci was from Milano. So this is, this is where he painted the famous Last Supper. Now it's interesting as the Last Supper was not in a big palace or anything. It was painted on the wall and ceiling of the dining hall of a church where a bunch of monks used to eat. So it's very interesting when you see that. I can't believe they restored it and still kept it up. It's pretty amazing that it's still going after, you know, after over 500 years. That's the church next to where the Last Supper is. And now, this is not the real Last Supper. They will um, tackle you and, you know, you know, rough you up and steal your camera if you dare take any pictures in there. They've got guards that are pretty amazing. And so, this is a replica sitting outside of it. But what's interesting is the Last Supper, this is what it looks like here. This is the door where you leave the dining hall to go into the church. And so it's literally painted above the door on the ceiling right here. And so when you go in there, they, they move you in about 50 people at a time, and you have exactly like five minutes to, to look at it, and then they, they hustle you out. So this is outside of the dining hall. This is what it looks like. I couldn't take any real pictures. But it's pretty, it's pretty amazing that it's literally on the paint above the door on the ceiling. So I'm, I'm just stunned that it's still there after all this time. Now, we're going to talk about lead. So let's see, I guess Abby, you're the, you're the first one. So what do leads, ogres, and onions have in common? Layers. All right, so let's talk about the layers of the eyelids. Starting externally, first layer. Skin. Second layer, we'll just go down the line. Uh, orbicularis. Orbicularis. Third layer. Tarsus. Tarsus. And what lives in the tarsus? Bovine glands. Bovine glands. Fourth layer. Conch. Conch. All right. So the palpebral conjunctiva. So now we're looking at this picture. What's different about this picture compared to the previous one? It's on string. Um, oh, it's flipped. Just seeing if you're paying attention. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll flip one just to see if you guys are awake. And you said it. What is this stain? Trichrome stain. Trichrome stain. And so. What are the what is trichrome stain red and what is trichrome stain blue? So blue is the connective tissue. Okay. And then pink is like the epithelium or wait, I'm like connective tissue. I forgot pink. Yeah, well pink is, is epithelium and also mesenchymal tissue. So oh, okay. on a trichrome stain, the muscle, the epithelium will all stain eosinophilic if they'll stain red. But the dense connective tissue of the tarsus stays blue. And so that's how, how we can delineate that a little bit. So now, we're looking at the skin. Why don't you swing around the corner? Tell us about the skin of the lid. Yeah. Oh, um, so, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so you can see that on the top surface there is uh, keratin. All right, so it's keratinized epithelium. And then right underneath that would be stratified squamous epithelium. Um, and then I think you can see some dermal appendages there. And then right underneath that, there's no dermis or fat. It goes right into muscle. All right, so what's different about lid skin compared to skin elsewhere in the body outside the lid is there's no true dermis, no true organized dermis. But also there's not fat except... Now, some of those older vets, you know, you can see they've got a lot of fatty infiltrate underneath, but most of the time there's no fat underneath there. And the other thing is there's not the reedy ridges and pegs that you have in normal skin elsewhere outside the eyelid. So you don't have that epithelium anchored as tightly down to the tissue. If you've seen someone who's got either an allergic reaction or got hit in the eye, you can get a tremendous amount of swelling under that epithelium. What's the layer underneath the epithelium? What muscle? All right, orbicularis muscle. So remember, the orbicularis muscle has three main parts. All right, what's one part of the orbicularis muscle? Tarsal. All right, so we call it the pretarsal, in front of the tarsus. Second part? Preceptal. Preceptal. So in front of the orbital septum, the third part? Yeah, they just call it orbital. So, so it's like it's like concentric C's, 
And so it comes in, and again, there's that little gap near the medial canthus. And so in front of the tarsus, and then in front of the septum, and then peripheral to that. And so you can see that that's what, it's, that's what it looks like right there. And remember, the orbicularis runs this way. It doesn't run you know, up and down. It runs sideways across it. So the orbicularis helps you to close the lid. It helps to keep the lid up against the cornea and up against the surface of the eye. All right, now we're going more inward. What's the third? Who's that back there? Is that Ashley back there? Yeah. All right, who's the, what's the third layer in? The tarsus. Now, in a primate, what is the tarsus comprised of? So very, very dense connective tissue. reason I, I said primate, if you're ever working with rats or rabbits or anything like that in your research, they have cartilage in the tarsus. But primates do not. So we have dense connective tissue, but we do not have cartilage in our tarsus. Okay, what, what glands live in the tarsus? Fibomian glands. All right, so now we can look at it right here. You can see that you've got the tarsus right here. You've got the fibomian glands. Now, what I like to do to remember this is Think of grapevines. Have you ever seen grapevines? There's clusters of grapes, and then they're on a central vine and then a trunk. And so basically these clusters of these grapes, the mygomian glands, dumped into this central duct, which then comes out just along the posterior surface of the lid and dumps out. And so this is where the mygomian glands, they dump their sebum component into it, okay? Now, while we're here, the fibromian glands dump one of the components of the tear film. What are the three layers of the tear film? So you have, oh gosh, the mucin layer, okay. and then the aqueous, and then the oil. All right, so what is, what is made by the fibromian glands? The oil. The oily layer. So the fibromian glands make the oil layer that coats the surface of the tears. That's thought to kind of keep the tears from evaporating. So even if you have normal aqueous production and you've got mybomian gland disease, you get what's called evaporative dry eyes. The, the aqueous will evaporate because you don't have that secretion of the mucin that's coming from these mybomian glands dumping into the uh, surface of the tear film. All right, so what are, what is this? Why would I be showing you this? Glands, probably related to the all right, now look more closely at those glands. So, like, uh, eccrine? Sort of exactly. So are my bomian glands eccrine glands? Yeah. Exactly. They are. They are. Take, take your head now. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, so when we think of glands, and people just take glands, but, but there's really three major groupings of glands, and the first is the so-called eccrine glands. And these are glands that have um, an acinar pattern. They form a circle of glands, and they secrete their material into the center of the lumen. And so these are lacrimal glands. These are also sweat glands, which you're now doing profusely right now. <laughs> eccrine glands are working beautifully at this point. And so Lacrimal glands in the lids are, are what are an example of the eccrine glands. And so they stay completely intact. <clears throat> they secrete into the lumen. Now the other thing is they have these little flattened myoepithelial cells that live between the acini of the lacrimal of the um, you know the eccrine glands. And so it's thought that these tend to squeeze if you think about it. So they kind of squeeze that secretion out. That's the way to remember it. Okay, now the lid margin. Is a target? Oh yes. So, is that the like the kind of sweat glands and all three of the lacrimal, like the cross root and lacrimal gland? Oh, <laughs> you just you just took my next pimp question after this slide, but that's okay. The answer is yes. All right. So the answer is yes. So you do get credit for that. All right. So now the lid margin, as they say in in top down, is the target-rich environment for asking questions. So a lot going on here on the lid margin. One thing I want to point out that we forget about is that stratified squamous epithelium on the surface of the lid doesn't end at the 
anterior margin of the lid, it ends almost at the posterior margin of the lid. And so, believe it or not, this is all keratinized. And so keratin is incredibly irritating to the surface of the eye. So if you have ectropia on the eyelid is turning in, even without lashes scraping, just that keratinized feeling will scrape. So that can really make a difference. But there's a lot going on right here. You can see here are the eyelashes. And what's interesting is you can see some of the lash follicles are really deep. So if someone's got trachiasis, they've got lashes turning in, you want to just pluck them out, they just grow right back. But if you want to kill the follicle, you can't just zap the edge of the lid. You have to go all the way down to the base of that follicle, which is sometimes at the top of the tarsus here. So here you've got a lot of these eyelashes here. You've got some glands associated with them. And then finally, posteriorly here, this is where the meibomian glands dump into the meibomian orifice. It's way on the posterior surface. All right, so we are looking at, this is an eyelash. Okay, so we've got a specific type of uh, gland that can be associated with the eyelash. And we're going to look, in fact, at two of the glands that are associated with the eyelash. Now, we're looking at this gland. What's going on with this gland? Um, so you see these little um, apical projections. Now, all right, you see these apical projections. So what kind of gland is this? It's an apocrine gland. An apocrine gland. So that's the second kind of gland that you have in the body. So apocrine glands are thought to be a, a scent gland. And so we've got in humans, we have a lot of apocrine glands in our axilla, in our groin, but even a few in the eyelid, and it's thought to be a remnant of an old scenting mechanism. And so some animals, like, I don't know if you've been out you're watching deer, when deer are marking their territory, aside from urine and other things, they'll often rub the inside of their eyelid on a branch and they'll leave some of that apocrine secretion to mark it. And so these are characterized by this apocrine projection. Now, what's interesting about these glands is when they secrete, they actually push off that portion of the apocrine um, apex coming out. So they not only secrete like a sebum-like material, but they also, you can see it pinches off the top of the apocrine projection. Now, how's the, what is the little, you know, mnemonic we use to remember what the apocrine glands are called? Anybody? Mole, all right, so what kind of an animal has a snout? A mole has a snout, and so we mispronounce these. These are the apocrine glands of mole. It's actually spelled mall, M-O-L-L. -L. But you mispronounce it as mole, and that's how you remember because moles have snouts, apocrine glands have snouts. And then of course we, yep. Okay, and of course we talked about the third type of gland, which is? Uh, holocrine glands. Holocrine glands, now, which is characterized by the sebaceous glands, the meibomian glands. Now, holocrine glands are different. They don't stay intact when they secrete. In fact, when they secrete in, into their lumen, they secrete their entire content. They literally regurgitate it. So, think back to your days in college when you're out a little bit too late, imbibed a little bit too much and you're sitting on that cool tile floor in the bathroom hugging that porcelain god and you become very religious at that point oh god i'll never drink again if i can get through this and so they literally regurgitate all their contents into the loom so those are uh, uh, the secretory glands the glands the zeiss gl i mean the glands of of uh, my bombing glands and also the glands of Zeiss, which are the glands that dump into the hair follicles. So, what kind of stain is this? So I guess we'll go back. Oil red oil. Oil red oil, and what is this stain? Stain limpets. Yeah, oil, exactly. So it's a very descriptive stain. It stains little circles of oil red, and so oil red oil. What do we have to do to the tissue in order to get this stain? You've got to get to fresh. Fresh, exactly, because when we process tissue for normal paraffin fixated embedding, we dissolve out the lipids. So if you're concerned about lipids, say you think maybe it's a meibomian gland carcinoma, then you have to have fresh tissue. So this shows you that fresh stain with the oil red oil of the meibomian glands. All right, let's talk about some lid lesions. What are we seeing here? What would be your differential of this, this particular lesion? A tool scar 
right? So now we look at it. Now this is a similar one, only this time it's a younger person who we see a couple of these lesions. So sometimes you can have more than one of these clustering. Sometimes these can be external, sometimes they can be internal. And what's the common pathologic findings in these lesions? Giant cells. All right, so you can see multinucleated giant cells epithelioid cells, but also you have a lot of lymphocytes in these. So this is called a lipogranulomatous inflammation. And if you get plugging of the meibomian glands, then they back up. And the lipid can then leak out of the glands. The lipid is very inflammatogenic when it's in, you know, underneath the, the epithelium and it's in the tissue. And so it's, once this lipid backs up, then it'll induce a granulomatous inflammation. And that's what we call common, I, I don't know, proper pronunciation, I don't have I don't have our German resident here, so I don't know if it's Calasian or Chalasian. We'll have to get the proper pronunciation from Lydia. Some people call it Calasian. And here's a close-up. That's a giant, giant cell. Look at the size of that. Huge, multi-nucleated giant cell. Lots of lymphocytes in here. So, lipogranulomatous inflammation, Chalasian or Calasian. What do we see in here? So, the external photograph of the left eye uh, is drawn to the upper yeah, the lateral aspect of a large uh, flesh like rich cystic lesion. Uh, it doesn't disrupt the flashes. Uh, it doesn't appear to disrupt the normal contour of the lid as well. Uh, what can you do in the clinic? A simple test to see if, if a lesion is cystic or solid? Exactly. So, you take your fan off head on your light, you can put it right next to it. And if it's a cyst, it'll just transilluminate right through. If it's solid, obviously the light won't pass through as much. So when we look at a cyst, the key thing we want to look at is we want to look at the cyst lining. So this particular cyst at low power, can you see anything at this low power that'll help guide you to what the lining of that cyst is? Okay, and then what is this stuff? Keratin, Keratin, so that's the tip off. So when you have a cyst that is lined by stratified epithelium on the lid, it's often got keratin in the middle of it. We call these epithelial cysts or epithelial inclusion cysts. And here's a little bit of a close up. There's that stratified squamous epithelium, but this is all keratin. So these cysts will just get filled with keratin. There's a close up stratified squamous epithelium. Lots of keratin. So epithelial cyst, epithelial inclusion cyst. Now we're looking at another cyst right here, a little bit different location, kind of the lateral canthal area. And what do we have on the lining of this cyst? Um, so what kind of cyst forms has one to two layers thick cuboidal lining? All right, so you can see one, one to two cell layers thick square, cuboidal, and no keratin or anything in there. So this is called an eccrine hydrocystoma. Hydrocystoma, literally, water-filled cyst. From which language? From the Greek, of course. So the Greeks invented all of ocular pathology. You know that, right? In fact, all of medicine comes from the Greeks. Okay, so... Sorry, I don't know if we have anyone here whose roots are from China or from India, but they claim they invented everything too. So, so as did the Romans, so everybody invented everything. So, all right, so that's an eccrine water-filled cyst. Now, this is a different one. What do we see in here? Epithelial lining. It's, it's hard to make out when it's a Let's go to higher power. What are those? Look at that. I mean. You know, those, those could be some big sounds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like big sounds. Yeah, it almost looks like a single layer. It's maybe one, one to two layers, six, lots of snouts. So what about the snouts? This? It's got me thinking about apocrine. Exactly. <laughs> so you can actually have an apocrine hydrocystoma, lots of snouts. So you get eccrine hydrocystomas much more commonly, but also you forget you've got those apocrine glands of who? Uh, mole. mole in the eyelids, and so this is an apocrine cyst. So you get apocrine cysts also. And here you can see it again. Look at all those little snouts sticking out into the lumen. 
Africa and hydrocystoma. All right, what are we seeing right here? I guess we'll go back to Ashley again. All right, what makes you say it's molluscum? All right, so a hint for oral boards. You guys still take oral boards? I'm sure they're now on, on Zoom. But when you're showing a picture, first thing you do is, is you do the thing. Well, it's an, out, it's an external photograph of the right upper lid, and it features several little lesions that have a raised pearly border and an umbilicated center. This is consistent with molluscum. So don't jump right to the diagnosis. Describe it first. And then they'll know what you're thinking was, and I'll give you credit for that. But your thinking was all correct, we just don't know what it was. And so, indeed, a cluster of these little lesions, they've got the pearly border, they've got this little umbilicated center. This is classic for molluscum contagiosum. And what does it look like pathologically? All right, so the central crater with the raised edges, epithelium markedly thickened. And what else do we see in molluscum that tells us pathologically that it's molluscum? Exactly. So they call them molluscum bodies. And so molluscum is a viral-induced disease, and so it tends to take over the cellular mach machinery like most viruses do. And so it'll take over the cell, and that epithelial cell will suddenly become a virus factory. And then you'll get all these clumped viruses, this eosinophilic staining material in the center, and they call this molluscum bodies. And the thing is, is they all dump out on the surface which then infects the epithelium adjacent to it. So it's pretty rare to have just a single mollusk. I don't know what single <laughs> mollusk is, but, um, but you usually have clusters because the virus will spell out and you'll get multiple clusters of these. All right, what are we looking at right here? I guess, is that the bar back there? Okay, what are we looking at right here? All right, so what would your differential be for a plaque, yellowish looking lesion on the skin there? I don't know. So, highest would be like plaque plasma, not like continuing to be like a stem cell plasma. All right, now we look at the pathology, and this is low power, and I want you to note, Sean Fett's going to be scared of the but look at these little kind of foamy, pale staining cytoplasm with the nucleus to the side. Here's a close up. Look the nucleus here, either in the center on the side, and this really ground glassy, foamy looking cytoplasm. So, what is this consistent with? All right. So, what, uh, what is that material that's in there? Exactly. So, it's cholesterol, it's lipid. And so, these are really foamy macrophages, we call them. Or, if you want to sound intelligent, you say everything with a British accent. So, you say macrophages. So these are macrophages in that lesion measured 1.2 centimeters in size. And so it just makes you sound you know, more articulate when you say it that way. So you can see these foamy macrophages. And so it's almost like they come in like little Pac-Man. And they gobble up that lipid that's here. And they gobble it up and they get really fat with lipid. And so you can see these nice foamy fat macrophages. <laughs> All right, I guess we're back back here to Abby. What are we seeing right here? And so it looks like a laurel head lesion not involved in the margin, no lash loss. It's raised, irregular surface, kind of vertical. What would you think this could be? It could be um, like, it doesn't look cystic. Um, it could be a, um, an SK or a papilloma. Yeah, so when you see this kind of raised, bumpy surface, one of the things you think about is a papilloma. And so when you go back here, you can see at low power, 
Indeed, you see that there are these little fingers of epithelium sticking out, and there's hyperkeratosis, a lot of keratin in between, but what I really want to look at is, look at these little teeny tiny blood vessels coursing in between these little fingers of epithelium sticking out. So the way we, re we remember squamous papilloma is it's like a gloved hand. And so you've got a thick glove, which is the thickened epithelium and the keratin in it, and then the fingers of these little fibrovascular cores in between. So this is a papilloma, classic papilloma. Another view, again, showing these fingers sticking out around the thickened acanthotic epithelium and a lot of hyperkeratosis on the surface. Here's a nice close-up that shows it beautifully. So gloved hand. Here's the glove, thick epithelium with the keratin. Here's the finger, with little fibrovascular pores in between. So this is a papilloma. It can be viral or it can be just the reaction. And so squamous papilloma benign. Now, sometimes you can get a lot of keratin worlds and keratin pearls mixed in here. A lot of these worlds and pearls of keratin. So definitely hyperkeratotic, a lot of worlds and pearls. There's a cross section. So just re think you've got your gloved hand here and you basically just cut the fingertips off right across. And so you see the center, the finger, and then the glove around it. So central fibrovascular cores, thickened acanthotic epithelium surrounding it. All right, what are we looking at right here? So this is a lesion that's phrased, it's pigmented, and it's got multiple areas that are kind of rough. This looks stuck on in areas. So what, what would this most likely be? This looks like a separate keratosis. To exactly. Me. So all that crusty looking material there, that is all keratin. And so these often look like what we call stuck on. And so it's almost like you could just get your finger under there and peel this guy off. And sometimes <laughs> patients do that. They try to peel these things off because there's a lot of keratin on there. And when we look at it pathologically, boy, it kind of looks a lot like a papilloma. The only difference is, is instead of those fingers sticking way out, the fingers go inward. And so this is kind of like a hairy spider, like a tarantula. So instead of the fingers going out, it's like they go in. And so you've got these epithelial cores going in, and then these fibrovascular tissue in between. Again, hyperkeratosis, keratin, worlds, keratin plugs in them, so seborrheic keratosis. And the other thing is these can often be um, brown or tan. And so it's not uncommon that you'll have this little layer of benign melanocytes along the basilar layer of a seborrheic keratosis, and that'll often give it its kind of brown or tannish color. All right, we've got kind of a similar lesion right here. So external photograph of the left, left eye. Um, tension drawn to like the lower lid, almost at the lid margin. There's like a rough, patchy nodule, um, probably some sort of keratin on the surface. Okay, so kind of a similar looking thing to separate keratosis. Now, when we look at it, we see that the epithelium, again, very thick, little fibrovascular cores in here. What is all this stuff down here? What is going on down here? Okay, exactly. So what causes this? Solar sun damage. Yeah, so this is what we call basophilic degeneration. So this is a UV, a solar-induced damage. And so remember, these lesions are often on sun-exposed skin. And so you can see a lot of UV damage underneath here. Now, when we look at the epithelium, I just want to point out it's a little bit more active than you see in a normal seborrheic keratosis. A low power, you can see that there's little nucleoli in here. These cells are just more active. There's a lot of keratin down deep. And this is consistent with what we call an actinic keratosis. So this is kind of a seborrheic keratosis, maybe more down the line. So this is kind of a pre-malignant lesion. And so solar damage, a lot of keratin, thick epithelium, but just a little bit more active. Nucleoli, clump chromatin. So 
kind of similar along the scale of separated keratosis, but now a little bit more active, so it's what we call an actinic keratosis. All right, what are we seeing on this picture? Um, so <coughs> as an external photograph is drawn to the lower eyelid, you have this nodular uh, lesion with central ulceration that's causing uh, flash loss, maybe a little bit of notching of the lid right there. Yeah, so this is different than what I've shown you before. Here there's lash loss, and the margin is kind of thick, and you've got this ulceration here. Is that important? Yeah, it suggests kind of more of a malignant process. All right, so whenever you see lash loss, you really want to be concerned of a possibility of a malignant lesion. So you're looking at this, it's on the lower lid, it's got raised borders, ulcerated center. What would be the most common cause of this lesion? Most common would be your basal cell. Okay, so if you're looking at lid tumors, and you'd have 100 lid tumors, 90 of them would be basal cells. And so if you're looking at this, probably 90% of all lid tumors are basal cell, 5, 6% squamous cell, and then maybe 1, 1 to 2% of the other tumors. So by far and away the most common, basal cell. Now, it's most common in the lower lid and the medial canthal area. Why? sun hits, hits that area. Yeah, your brow shades. And so if you think about it, your brow and your you know eyebrow here and your, your uh, bony prominence here kind of shade the upper lid a little bit. So if you're looking at a sun-induced lesion, which basal cell is, it's more inferior and inferior medium because it's not quite shaded. So that's where you most commonly see these. Now, these can present sometimes differently. Believe it or not, this is a basal cell Yet, it almost looks like a solid nodule. But again, some notching, look at the loss of lesions. So again, concern for a basal cell. What does a basal cell look like pathologically? We'll go ahead and put it in one. Um, yeah, we see palisade nuclei um, and then meaningful artifacts, which is just kind of like the space that we see around the palisade nuclei. All right, so we call it palisading or lining up like a little picket fence. So last picture. Um, if you consider the loss of lashes, if you saw that for a minute, would you have to remove like more than just that vocal area? Exactly. So the problem is, is sometimes you don't know exactly where the tumor is and where it isn't. And so if you've got a nodule here, you may not want to just remove it there and there, because look over here, a little bit of thickening here, a little bit of thickening here. So you probably, when you're going to try to remove these, you want to make sure you've got clear margins, so you want to remove a lot more than you think just by looking at the lesion. All right, so palisading. The nuclei in a basal cell, they form these nodules. They line up at the edges. So think of it as a white picket fence surrounding a house. And so it's like a little picket fence surrounding it. And then because these tumor nodules tend to be more solid, they shrink more when we process. So this is what we call a meaningful artifact, meaning it's an artifact but it's meaningful because basal cells, nodules of them shrink more than the tissue around them, and you get this little white space around them. It's a so-called meaningful artifact. And here's a close-up. You see the cells themselves, they're large, basal extending nucleus, very scant cytoplasm, but benign appearing. So if you look at these, they really do behave in a, in a more benign way. They'll often be solid or cystic, and they don't usually metastasize basal cells. And here's what we call a cystic basal cell, or nodulocystic. So big nodule, cyst in the center. But look even at low power. Look at the palisading. Look at the little white halo around them where the tissue shrinks more. So nodulocystic basal cell, by far the most common variety. But you can have another variety. Let's go behind you there, Anthony. Another variety of basal cell. So so nodules, these look more diffuse, finger-like. Projections and I think this would be more more feeform. All right, so more feeform is that something you know that you need to be concerned more about than a nodule cystic basal cell? Uh, I think it'd be worse. Okay, so the reason is the more feeform basal cell sends little fingers of basal cell out underneath the tissue, and it can even spread under the epithelium in what's called the pagetoid type spread. So the problem is you can't see where this is. So you, you know, nodular type, you can see the nodule, you can cut it out, morpheiform type, 
these little fingers extend out and it, it induces a dense fibrous connective tissue in between. So they call this a scarus reaction, fibrous tissue reaction. So morpheiform, if you're doing a surgery for a morpheiform basal cell, you often have to do a particular technique. And who's this technique named after? Mo. So now it's Mo, M-O-H-S. It's not Mo, you know, of the three stooges. You know, not, not, not Mo. And so if you ever look at those three stooges, it's very bad for kids. They wouldn't allow them on TV now because they're poking each other's eyes out all the time. My God, you look at that. So different Mo. So this is Mo's uh, the surgeon. And so Mo surgery, what you do is, is you shave off little pieces around the tumor, and then you actually have a um, area right next to the OR where they freeze the tissue and stain it for you, and you can look. And that way you can make sure you've taken out all of this tissue. And so now this is another type, a little, you know, really obscure variant. I won't even ask anybody about that. But sometimes these basal cells can take on a more glandular element. And so they'll even have like a glandular type of basal cell. Now, this is a little bit of a different looking basal cell. Now, what are we looking at right here? Uh, this is the, the calcine bond that has keratin. Exactly. So we call this a basal squame. The reason that that's important is the basal squame is a little bit more aggressive than a simple basal cell. So basal squame is carcinoma. They take on more characteristics of a squamous cell addition to a basal cell. Now, the reason for that is basal cells arise from a pluripotential cell along the basal layer of the epithelium. So they can actually transform into more like squamous cells or more like basal cells, both. Now, you say basal cells a benign lesion. Yeah, that's true. This is a patient that Rick Anderson had seen even before Boopy was here. This is an old picture. This lady is a, is a rancher from Nevada. She came in. We did a biopsy. She had morpheiform basal cell. They said, we've got to take this out or it can grow. She said, I'm an old lady. Leave me alone. And she went back home. This is now 10 years later. Now, her daughter brought her in. She had a piece of Kleenex stuck over this lesion. We took off the Kleenex. This is what it looks like. Now, the reason that the daughter brought her in is because it smelled. And so you can see if you let a basal cell grow for 10 years, believe it or not, that's the sinuses you're looking at. And there was even CSF dripping out. So by now, this is more than just a housekeeping problem. I mean, you have to do a hemifacectomy to take care of this. And so, you know, morphia forms, get them out while you can. Don't let them grow to this type of lesion. This took 10 years, but it can be quite destructive if you let it grow locally. All right, different kind of lesion. Yes, this looks like <clears throat> external photograph of the left eye on the lateral cankle area of the upper eyelid. This is extremely large, firm appearing, uh, like a brown, crusty ulceration. Um, I'd be concerned if like a squamous all right, so because you've got this kind of parchment look to it, um, not so much ulceration, but this parchment look to it, you'd be concerned about an epithelial lesion in this case. And of course, the most common one in the upper lid is a squamous cell. Now, sometimes, look at this patient, a lot of sun damage all over the skin, but um, it's interesting. They call this a rodent lesion. Now, again, my brain remembers things differently. And so, a rodent lesion. It looks like a rodent took a bite out of it. So that's how I remember rodent lesion. It looks like a mouse nibble on it. And so it's got this little erosion here. And that can also be a squamous cell. And how is a squamous cell different than a basal cell? Um, you yeah, have hyperkeratosis. Uh, um, you can get keratin worlds as well. Yeah, keratin worlds. And the cells are not these big blue nuclei. They're more this, this pink cytoplasm with a nucleus that's got nucleoli in it and a pink cytoplasm. So a lot different looking. Looks like epithelium, basically, only it is active at this point. Squamous world, squamous pearl. So this is squamous cell carcinoma. Now, what are we looking at right here? External photograph of the right eye. Um, there's 
thickening, especially of the upper eyelid margin. The eye is very angularly injected. Um, and, you know, in this context, with that diffuse thickening loss of lashes, we'd be concerned about a um, sebaceous carcinoma. Okay. So we call sebaceous gland or myobomian gland carcinoma the great mimicker because it'll often present like something else. So this particular patient had a red irritated eye. This has gone on for like a month. And so first thing, what do the, they do? They go to the doc in the box, you know? So what do you get when you go to a doc in the box? Everybody gets genomycin. So I don't know where in the teaching of medical students now they trained you to use genomycin, but nobody uses genomycin. I, you guys have probably never even written a script for genomycin. They get genomycin. And then the patient comes back two weeks later and they say, oh, it's still irritated. Oh, here, we'll switch you to Neosporin. So then they use Neosporin. It's not any better. Finally, the patient comes in to see you and you see them. You say, wow, look at this lid margin. Look how thick that is. And those yellowish areas indicative of lipid loss of lashes. So your concern here would not be a chronic, you know, blood for conjunctivitis, but would be a myobomian gland carcinoma. Now, these can sometimes be a little bit more subtle. In fact, this particular patient presented with what was called a recurrent chalazion. So they had a chalazion and they treated it with hot packs. Bless you. It went away. It, it came back again. But look at that. It's kind of lumpy, bumpy, loss of lashes. And so, again, the great mimicker. And so sometimes my bone and gland carcinomas can present as a recurrent chalazion. And you look at them, you can see this particular one, at least it's got kind of a glandular look to it. You see all those little white spaces. That's the dissolved lipid from when you do the normal processing. So it, it still at least looks like a gland, but sometimes these can be extremely uh, anaplastic, and they don't even look like glands. And if you look right here, look at how active that looks. Now, that's important because remember I showed you basal cells. They look kind of benign. They behave benign. These look really malignant, and they can't be malignant. In fact, these can metastasize. So these could be very nasty tumors. And in fact, if we look at a close-up, Ashley, what are we seeing right here? I see a lot of lesions. Like the eye. Yeah, I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Exactly. That's a mitotic figure. So these are very active lesions. They have mitotic figures in them. Now, these can be poorly differentiated. Yeah, that's a nice mitotic lesion. But one of the things that can help, look at these little white areas here. That is dissolved lipid. And so that often helps to, to differentiate this when you look at it pathologically. And then, of course, what kind of stain is this? Oil red oak. Oil red oak. So it stains the oil, little round O's of oil. And so this tissue has to be... Well, what, how do you have to prep the tissue to do this thing? Oh, fresh. Fresh. So remember, you can't put it in formal, and this has to be fresh tissue. So here's an oil red O stain of a mygomian gland carcinoma. All right, what are we seeing right here? Let's see, Kabar. Okay, so what would you be concerned about here? All right, so when you see a pigmented lesion, first thing you always want to think about is, boy, you don't want to miss a melanoma. And so you look at it and you say, well, there's no loss of lashes. It's kind of uniformly elevated, probably a nevus. And we look at it, and what does this show? All right, so they're at the junction, but also they are at subepithelium. So what would we classify this as? Compound. So if the melanocytes are just at the junction, we call it junctional nevus. If they're at the junction and underneath it combined, we call it a compound nevus. If they are just completely below the epithelium and don't affect the junction, we call this a dermal nevus. Exactly. Now remember, in the lid, there's no dermis, so it's an incorrect term, but it's there. So we still call it a dermal nevus. But technically, I guess we should call it subepithelial nevus, but it's still it's a dermal nevus. All right, now we're looking here. Abby, anything alarming in this picture? Uh, yeah, the spread along the margin as well as lash loss. All right, so your concern here would be 
melanoma. What? Like a melanoma. Melanoma, exactly. So you can see again, sun damaged skin. You know, these lesions don't just pop up out of the blue. They'll often occur in people who've had a lot of sun exposure, a lot of UV exposure. Now, just like my bony black carcinomas, these can metastasize and people can, can die from these. And so you want to not miss these. And when you look at it, you see these nests of melanocytes. They're underneath the epithelium here. But you look at them in close up, look at the little nuclear lines. So you see these are active. Now, they, they don't necessarily have to be black in pigment. They can be just brownish pigment. And then, um, you know, that's the malignant melanoma. Now, we're looking at a lesion here. This guy did not get punched out. So this isn't, you know, your Saturday night referral from Rock Springs. Uh, <laughs> You can, you can talk about your own hometown, you're allowed, <laughs> so that's okay. So what are we seeing here? All my attention is drawn to a very swollen left upper yeah, lip. Kind of swollen, push on it, it's not cystic, it's very doughy, it's almost infiltrative. And then you look at it and you see these cells. What are these? It looks like lymphocytes. Exactly. So. This is just a sheet of lymphocytes. So don't forget, although lymphomas are most common in the orbit and also conjunctiva, they can extend sometimes underneath the lid. And so you don't want to miss a lymphoma that either... Now, primary lymphoma rising just under the lid is pretty darn uncommon. It's usually an extension of an orbital lymphoma. But you see this uniform sheet of these lymphocytes. And so this is lymphoma of the lid. And when we get to orbit, we'll talk more about how we stain and how we differentiate lymphomas. Right, this is an interesting lesion. What are we seeing right here? So external photograph, attention paid to the left eye of the upper lid. Uh, is a sort of violaceous nodular appearing lesion with erosion of the lid itself, uh, especially the more lateral. All right, so you would be concerned about this. Now, I don't expect you to know what this is because I just want to show you there can be really obscure lesions in the eyelid. But the key thing I want you to recognize is it is this big kind of violaceous dome-shaped lesion, loss of lashes. Uh, it's really irritating and there's this crustiness around it. And we did a biopsy on this and this turned out to be a very obscure tumor called a Merkel cell tumor. And these are tumors that, again, can be very aggressive. Look at that mitotic figure there. A big mitotic figure, these big cells um, with mitotic figure. And so you can get very obscure tumors. This is thought to be a neuroendocrine-derived cell, very obscure tumor. But just remember, you can get weird, rare tumors of the lid also. So I want to show you one more. Um, what could this be? So these are kind of epithelial looking cells and then they're surrounded by all this stuff around them. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what that is. Okay, believe it or not, you can also get um, um, tumors that, that are um, mucin producing. So this is an adenocarcinoma. And so I really miss Fred Jacobiak was the um, ocular pathologist. He used to be at the AFIP in New York and then eventually ended up in Boston at Mass Eye here. But He's just the, he was the, the best lecturer on ophthalmology. Sadly, he passed away a year and a half ago. But he would, he would describe this as islands of epithelial cells surrounded by a sea of mucin. And so think about it. These little islands of these epithelial cells. This is actually adenocarcinoma, and this is all mucin. And then we do a mucin stain, and you can see the mucin stains pink here. This is called a mucicarmine, a mucin stain. And you get these islands of theta cells surrounded by a sea of mucin. So I just wanted to show you those last two. I hope they don't put something that obscure on boards. You never know, but hopefully they wouldn't. Um, but you can have very strange, very weird tumors occurring in the eyelid, both primary and metastatic, mostly primary, but weird ones. And so this is an adenocarcinoma of the lid. And so very obscure too. And last but not least, we say goodbye to the Last Supper once again. And 
this is actually I said the door into the tent church from the dining hall. And there's the last supper. Now I wanted to leave just a couple minutes. I only got like five minutes. Questions. That means you guys know it all. Yes. For the sebaceous cell, is there anything unique, like characteristically, that causes like the patagoid spreads of the skip lesions that they talk about? You know, I'm not sure exactly what it is that leads to that. And so sometimes what will happen is you get that little pagetoid spread, it'll skip around, and it's almost like the um, basal cell carcinomas, the morphiform basal cells. For some reason, these cells will skip areas and go around. I'm not sure what it is. They're not the ones that have that pagetoid type spread. If you look at them, it's not like they're less differentiated because the tumors are poorly differentiated anyway. So I'm not sure what exactly the etiology is. But those amorphiform basal cells, for some reason, they're not continuous. They'll actually skip the spread in a pathogen matter. So that makes them, again, amenable to more of a Mohs type surgery than just a direct uh, surgery. Other questions? All right, next week is Conj. I believe we're in order again. So next week will be Conj. All right, thanks.